All right, guys, but let's get started. So this is chapter nine, patterns of inheritance. Okay, so you are going to learn about how the genes that you inherit from your parents, how what genes you got, whether they were dominant or recessive, how that determines the traits that you have and that we all have and what your children have, okay, or what your children are going to have if you don't yet have children. Okay, so it's cool, it's fun stuff. All right, so let's start out with a little bit of a history lesson about who really was the founding father of genetics research. And that is credited to Gregor Mendel, Gregor Mendel, okay? He began conducting experiments breeding pea plants, pea plants. Okay, he was, he lived, he was, a, he was a, a religious man, a holy man, he was a monk, and he lived in an abbey. And so these pea plants grew in the garden of the abbey. And over the years that he was living there, he noticed that there were a tremendous amount of variety in the pea plants. Okay, they could have a variety of flower colors, they could have a variety of seed colors, they could have a variety of seed shapes. Okay, so there's this tremendous variety in these pea plants. And he wondered, why did that happen? How is there this variety? What determines this? Okay, and so to explore those questions, he conducted experiments using these pea plants. Okay, and using these experiments that I'm going to detail shortly, he showed that parents do pass heritable factors, okay, which we now call genes, to offspring. And that determines the traits that are expressed in those offspring. Okay? Now, pea plants, pea plants were a really good specimen, a really good species to use for this experiment. Because, first of all, he could control their matings. He, you know, do you guys know about flowers, that flowers, many, most plants can actually reproduce asexually and sexually? Okay? And so, one of the things he did to prevent a flower from reproducing asexually, from fertilizing itself, was he could remove a sex organ from a flower. Okay, like the male sex organ the sperm producing sex organ of the flower, he could remove it, and that way he could control the mating. He can make sure that that flower cannot fertilize itself, it can only fertilize another flower. Sexual reproduction, okay? And then he could look at those different characteristics and quantify the abundance of a certain trait versus another, okay? So let's take a look at what he did in his experiment. So this is a look at his experiment, okay? So first of all, we, he was going to breed together, cross, a white flowered plant with a purple flowered plant, okay? But first he had to make sure it could not reproduce asexually. So he removes the stamen from the purple flower, and then he collects pollen from the white flower and then brushes the pollen on the purple flowered plant, fertilizing the purple flower with sperm pollen from the white flowered plant, okay? Then what happened? Fertilization happened, the seeds ripened and matured, okay? And then eventually he planted all of those seeds from that pea pod, and guess what? All of those babies all of the offspring, the first generation of offspring, otherwise known as the F1 generation, all had the purple characteristic, no white. Before even moving any further, what does that tell you? What is dominant? Purple. Purple is dominant to white in terms of flower color in pea plants, okay? And generally that is how it works. Usually dark colors are dominant to light. Okay, and in this case, yes, purple was dominant and occurred in the first generation. All of them were purple. And I'll tell you about that why in a little bit. But first, let's go through an introduction to some terminology. Okay. Okay, the terminology is coming next, but 
So let's, let's take a look at this. This is what happened, kind of as a little overview of what happened. So one parent is purple, one parent is white, right? The F1 generation was all purple because that was the dominant color. Then what happens is then he took two of those purple flowered plants from the first generation, the F1, and he crossed them together. So he produced offspring in the second generation, the F2 generation, and guess what happened? That white color came out again, okay? So yes, most of the F2 generation had the purple flower color, but that other color, white, came out in that next generation, okay? So I'll show you how you would actually figure that out using something called a Punnett square, which is used to solve probabilities of inheritance. Okay, here's this terminology, all right? So first of all, I already talked about this. What are heritable factors? They are genes. And genes exist as alternative forms, okay, called alleles. Most genes are determined by two alleles. You get one from your mom, you get one from your dad when fertilization happens, okay? All alleles are alternative versions of genes. A genotype. A genotype is simply the listing of alleles for a trait, okay? So for example, using H's, a genotype could be this, big H, big H, okay? A genotype could also look like this, big H, little h, and a genotype could also look like this, all right? A genotype is simply the listing of alleles for a trait, okay? This is an allele, and this is an allele. Each of these letters are symbolizing alleles for a certain trait, okay? This genotype is called homozygous. Homozygous means two copies of the same allele, all right? What about this? Is this also homozygous? Yes, this is also homozygous. Little h, little h, also homozygous. You got two copies of the same allele. However, in genetics, we generally use capital letters to refer to dominant traits, okay? And we use lowercase letters to refer to recessive traits, okay? So this is the homozygous dominant genotype. This is homozygous recessive, okay? What about this one? You got two different alleles here, big H and little h. That's called heterozygous because you've got two different alleles. Two different alleles, one dominant, one recessive. So that's heterozygous. But what trait do you think is going to be expressed in the heterozygous genotype? The dominant trait. In most cases, there are some exceptions, yes. If you've got a heterozygous genotype, only the trait expressed by the dominant allele will be expressed. Okay, the trait expressed by the recessive allele can only be expressed if you have the homozygous recessive genotype, like little h, little h. Okay, now a phenotype, that's another really important vocab term, the phenotype. The phenotype is the expression of the genotype. It is something's appearance. It's, what's you, it's what you can see or measure, okay? A trait that can be seen or measured is the phenotype, and it is determined, of course, by the genotype, okay? So let's just say that H's refer to your height, okay? H for height. These letters that we use are pretty random, okay? They're basically something that kind of helps you to think about a certain trait. So if I want to talk about your height, your stature, I can use H's. But I could also use H's to talk about hair, right? Okay, so just, just don't 
be too concerned about what letters we use for things. You could really use whatever letters you like, okay? But generally, we use the ones that sort of make sense in the trait that we're talking about, okay? So if I'm talking about height, okay, and let's just say that tall is dominant to short, okay? Big H is dominant to little h, okay? Big H, allele for tall, little h, the allele for short, okay? So what phenotype is going to be expressed by this genotype, big H, big H? Tall. tall, okay? So phenotype is tall. What about this genotype, big H, little h? What phenotype? Tall, tall. okay? Remember, tall is dominant to short, okay? Little h, little h? Short. short. Okay. So does that make sense? I just want you guys to really know the difference between genotypes and phenotypes right now. Okay, genotypes, the listing of alleles or descriptions of the alleles like homozygous dominant, heterozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, okay? And then phenotypes, the expression of the genotype, right? What you can see or measure. You guys clear on that? Okay. All right. Now remember that these genes are on your chromosomes that you inherit from both of your parents, right? Remember this from last week, the homologous chromosomes? Do you guys remember how many total pairs of chromosomes are homologous, completely homologous, which means they have the same size, location of the centromere, and gene loci? How many pairs are completely homologous? Not all 23. 22. 22. That's right. Not the X and Y. They're not homologous. But 22 pairs of chromosomes are homologous. Autosomes? Autosomes. That's correct. 22 pairs of autosomes. Okay. And so take a look. You see an indication on this slide about the location of the genes, the gene loci. Gene loci is just a fancy way of saying locations of genes. All right? So let's take a look. Let's say you got the red chromosome from your dad and you got the blue chromosome from your mom. Okay? Well, on that one gene locus, you got a dominant allele, capital P, big P, from dad, and you also got the same allele from mom. So you are homozygous dominant for that trait, whatever trait that is, coded for by the big P. Okay? Take a look at this locus. Okay? You've got two recessive alleles, one from dad, one from mom. So you're going to have the homozygous recessive trait that's coded for by that gene. Okay? And then take a look at that green locus right there. You got heterozygous, right? You got a big B from your dad, you got a little B from your mom, so you are big B, little B, heterozygous for that trait. Okay? So does that make sense that gene loci reside at the same location on homologous chromosomes, but you could have different alleles on those loci, right? Just like how you've got the big B there and the little B there. All right? Okay, so now let's start getting into the whole meat of this lecture. And we gotta start with understanding that the boxes, this right here that you see, this box, is called a Punnett square. And these Punnett squares are probability tables. Okay, probability tables. So unless your outcome is 100% chance that you're going to get a certain outcome. Everything is just a probability that something's going to occur. It's not going to tell you a certain event that's definitely going to happen unless your probability comes out to 100%. Okay? So let's take a look at some of the background behind the setup. How would you set up a probability table, a Punnett square? Okay? We have to start with the, what happens during meiosis during the formation of gametes, right? What are gametes? Sex cells like sperm and eggs, okay? Sperm and eggs. We gotta figure out what alleles are going to be carried 
by these gametes, by these sperm and eggs. Okay? So let's take a look. So if we have a heterozygous male, a heterozygous dad, all right, when he makes sperm, 50% of his sperm are going to carry the big B allele, and 50% of his sperm are going to carry the little b allele. All right, right? Why does that happen? Because of what happens at anaphase, right? The sister chromatids separating, going to opposite poles for each cell that gets created. Okay, that's why. So 50% big B, 50% little b. Female, in this case, she has the same exact genotype for that trait, big B, little b. So when she makes eggs, 50% of her eggs carry the big B, 50% of the eggs carry the little b. Okay, so that's how you set it up, okay? You can put your male's gametes here, your female's gametes here, all right? Now, the next thing that happens is we have to fill in our probability table, okay? So what we do is we bring together our possible outcomes of our gametes and we see what's going to happen. And the rule of multiplication applies here, okay, right? So if we want to consider what do we get in this box right here, we have to multiply one half times one half. And that gives you one quarter. One fourth, the rule of multiplication, okay? And so you have a 25% chance then of having a homozygous dominant genotype, right? Big B, big B. Okay, you can keep on going. In this box, how do we get this? Well, we got a big B from dad, we got a little B from mom, one half times one half equals one quarter. Heterozygous, one of each, one dominant, one recessive, okay? And you can keep on going in the other boxes the same way, right? Now, the next step, now that we've filled in our box, is to really analyze our results. And in here, the rule of multiplication, the rule of addition applies, the rule of addition, okay? So let's see, are there any other squares that are both heterozygous dominant? Are there any other squares other than one that's heterozygous dominant? Heterozygous dominant, big B, big B, no, okay? So what do we get as our end result? Well, we get 25% big B, big B. There's nothing more to be added to that, okay? How about your heterozygous genotype? One of each, big B, little b. 50%, because you have to add one quarter plus one quarter, this is the same outcome, right? One quarter plus one quarter equals 50%, one half, okay? So then you would write up, okay, well, heterozygous genotype, 50%. What about the homozygous recessive genotype, little b, little b? Just 25%, right, one quarter, okay? So you have to look at the outcome in your probability table, your Punnett square, and figure out your total chances of a certain outcome. What are the chances that these offspring are going to end up with a certain genotype? Okay? And that's how you would do it. You apply the rules of multiplication to filling in the box and the rule of addition for figuring out what you already got in your box and summarizing your result. Okay? All right, and I'm going to show you how this applies to the example I already talked about with the flower color and the purple and white flowers I started with. Do you have a question? But would this like apply to um, like the actual sex of the, the child? Like the if you are considering the sex chromosomes, the same thing. Let me give you an example of that since you're asking, okay? So in terms of sex determination, okay, that's a good question. You guys probably know that what are the odds of having a boy or girl baby? 50%. Well, guess what? Males have what two sex chromosomes? XY. Okay, so males are XY, women are what? XX. Okay, so when men make sperm, 50% of the sperm are going to carry the X, and the other 50% of the sperm are going to carry what? The Y. Female, when she makes eggs, 
Okay, 50% of the eggs are going to carry the X, and the other 50% of the eggs are going to carry the X as well. Okay, so when we fill in our box, what are we going to get? XX, what about here? XY, XX, XY. So what do we get? What's our rule of addition? Okay, what's the probability of having a girl baby? Okay, one quarter plus one quarter equals one half, right? 50%. And then XY plus XY, 50%. That's why. That's why the sex ratio is 50-50. And also, girls can do nothing about making boys. Okay, it's all about what sperm got into that egg. Okay? Because 50% of the sperm are going to have the X, 50% are going to have the Y. If the Y sperm gets into the egg, it's a boy. If it's the X sperm that gets into the egg, it's a girl. Men determine the sex of the child. Okay? It, every time there was a fertilization event, there was a 50% chance of that outcome. So that, that statement does, it doesn't apply whatsoever. What do you mean? When you have like some families that are mostly male, mostly females. It's, it, it, it still works. It's still the same thing. It just means every time there was a fertilization, there was a 50% chance that it was going to happen. Like, for example, one of my grandmothers, she had, she had nine total children, right? She had six girls in a row, and then she had three boys. Okay? But every time they, there was a conception, a fertilization, there was a 50% chance of either of those sexes. So but that's what I'm saying. The statement doesn't apply when you hear like men saying, I only make boys. That's no, that's true. just, there's no science behind that. It's not possible. <laughs> not possible. Okay. Okay, so now let's get into some principles and laws. So Mendel's law of segregation. This applies to how you set up your Punnett square, your probability table, okay? Mendel's law of segregation states that allele pairs segregate from each other. They separate from each other, okay, during gamete formation. So that each gamete, each sperm or egg, only carries one allele for a trait, okay? That's all about the behavior of the chromosomes during anaphase, all right? And we can perform a monohybrid cross. What does that word imply, mono? Mono means what? One, okay? A monohybrid cross will allow you to predict the probability of inheriting one characteristic, one single trait. Okay, such as the example that I gave you guys earlier with the flower color, purple and white. All right, so let's go back to that example and we can do some Punnett squares together to figure out why we got that outcome in the F2 generation with most of the flowers purple but some of the flowers white. Okay, so remember, we started off with our parental generation. P1 means parental. Parental generation, one flowers were purple, and in one the flowers were white. All right, so this is how it happened according to how you could set up a Punnett square. So our P1 generation, our parental generation, was true breeding, okay? If you have a true breeding parents, it means that they are homozygous, okay? So the purple flowered plant was true breeding, which means it was homozygous dominant, big P, big P, and it crossed with a true breeding white recessive parent, okay? Little P, little P. So now if you have a parent with a big, with a homozygous dominant genotype, when they, when that dad makes sperm, they're gonna, all the sperm can only carry one possible allele, right? Big P. It's got no other allele to give. It's only got big P, okay? 
And then when you've got the other parent who's homozygous recessive, sometimes I like to use lines underneath undercase letters to help you differentiate them, especially if they look similar, if they're capital and undercase. Okay, so if I draw lines under things, it means it's lowercase, all right? Um, this mom, when she makes eggs, they can only carry what allele? Little p, small p, the recessively a little p, okay? So when you set that up, you know, you're going to get all heterozygous offspring, just like you had in your first generation. Remember your first generation? Okay, all purple? That's because they were all heterozygous. And if you want to check and make sure that that's how it's supposed to happen, you can always set up a Punnett square for your F1 generation. All right, so dad, half of the sperm, big P, other half of the sperm, big P. Mom, half of the eggs, little P, the other half of the eggs, little P. And when you bring it together, you get big P, little P across the board. Okay, that's why all the offspring were purple, because they had at least one copy of the dominant allele, big P, that coded for the purple flower color. Okay, now where it gets really interesting is when we want to look at the second generation, the F2 generation. Okay, this is the F1. Now we're going to take two individuals from the F1 generation and we're going to cross them together. Okay, that allows us to see some interesting stuff. So let's do over here, we're going to cross a big P little p with another big P little p. Okay, so what are we going to put on top of this box? If this is one of the parents' genotypes, what are we going to put here? Big P. What about here? Little p. Okay, here's mom. What are we going to put over here? Big P. What about here? Little p. Okay. Now, how do we fill in the box? What are we going to put in this box? Two big P's. Big P, big P. What are we going to put here? Big P, little p. What about here? Big P, little p. It's always good practice to keep the dominant allele in front of the recessive. Okay? Because it looks, makes more sense like that. What about in here? Little p, little p. Remember what the outcome was? That three quarters were purple and only one quarter was white? This is why. Okay? These three genotypes, because they have at least one dominant big P, are going to express the purple flower color, right? And only this one genotype will give you the white color, all right? Now, this is something that you should remember, okay? Take a look at this. Whenever you have two parents who are both heterozygous for one trait, you will always get this outcome, okay? You get a three to one phenotypic ratio, that's the ratio of purple to white, okay? Three quarters are gonna be purple, and only one quarter will be white. 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio will always happen if both parents are heterozygous for one trait. Same thing with the genotypic ratio. If both parents are heterozygous for one trait, you will always get the 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. Okay, that's just the breakdown of the number of different genotypes you have, right? Okay, so how many out of four were homozygous dominant? Just one, right? One, big P, big P. Okay, how many were heterozygous, big P, little p? Two out of four, right? So there's the two in the ratio. And then how many were homozygous recessive? Just one, okay? So that's the one to two to one genotypic ratio. Both constants, yes? By looking at it, can you determine like which one of the purple flowers are actually the dominant? The purple flower, the purple color is dominant. I mean like, you see how you set it up? 
where two of them are heterozygous? Oh. Can you just look at it and tell which one is the you can, dominant? Homozygous dominant is, is purple, but no, you'd have to see what would come out in the next generation if you bred them together. No. Second question, is a way to scientifically like test out the flower and be able to tell? Yeah, you have controlled breedings, like you could cross this genotype with this genotype, and if you get a certain outcome, then you'll know that that was heterozygous and not completely homozygous. Because let's just say, if you crossed this with that, all the offspring are going to be what? Purple. But if you cross this with this, you could do a Punnett square to figure out what would happen. We might as well do it since we're on that topic. Okay. So if you wanted to cross a big P, little p, heterozygous with a homozygous recessive, because you didn't know that this was homozygous dominant or not, you're going to get a 50-50 outcome. Okay, see this? 50% purple, 50% white. After you perform the mating. That's correct. That's correct. Well, you, oh, you could check in a laboratory. You could do genetic testing on what you're working with, but that would cost money. It would be an expense. And it did not exist during Mendel's time.